Well, welcome to our first ever podcast. I'm Yael right. Pinto. I'm Mati Shoshani. It's good to be here. It's good to be with you in the studio, Yael. Yeah, and we're going to talk about a lot of things. I think today the biggest thing that happened in Israel is the Iranian attack. Yeah. I think we can talk about it for uh, a long time, but let's start, I think, with a bit of history. Why do the Iranians care about attacking Israel? Yeah, May- maybe we can take two lines on like what we're actually planning mm-hmm. to do here. Uh, one, I'm excited because we always have, you know, we're, we're always limited in time and what we can say and what we can do. True. And some of these topics, they just, they require more conversation. They require more depth to understand what really happened. Iran is high on that list. Yeah. You know, like, how do, how do you explain the events of, you know, the last couple of days or a couple of days ago of Iran attacking Israel? How do you explain them and not just, like, focus on just the facts, like what's behind them? What does it mean? How do we go from there? How do we like understand the meaning to us, the history of it? I mean, there's a lot to unpack. Oh, definitely. Things that I want to talk about also is the Iranian side. Yeah. Why do the Iranian people want to attack Israel? Why did they attack Israel? What do they gain from it? What do they lose from it? So anyway, we got a lot to, to discuss. And, and that's what we hope to do with this podcast. Yeah. It's to like have the time to go deeper and give more information and educate more beyond just like the headlines. The headlines are good on a daily basis. Yeah. You got to dive deeper than that. You really need to understand why these things are happening mm-hmm. and how all the many, many dots connect to each other. I think it's also a good option for people to listen on podcasts without uh, looking at us all day, you know, give them a break from seeing our faces. Yeah. I think that's a good well-needed addition. break. <laughs> so today, today we're talking Iran and the, the, the crazy attack that happened, you know, recently. Well, yeah, 300 uh, missiles, drones, ballistic missiles, and other things that were fired at Israel in the middle of the night. Yeah. Pretty, pretty big. So we outlined for ourselves, you know, what, what's the first question to ask? It's like, how do you get here? Like, yeah. how did this start? Yeah. And it's easy to just jump to Saturday night, you know, what happened, here are the facts, one, two, three, four. But the facts don't just come out of thin air. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And in general, Iran and Israel were not always enemies. We used to be allies yeah. back back in the day. It was a long time ago. Now when you talk about Iran, you always talk about like the biggest sponsor of terrorism in the Middle East, but this yeah. wasn't the case always. Yeah. If this is the first time you're watching this type of content, we're going to be doing this on a regular basis. So make sure to follow wherever you're watching this. It's going to be on both YouTube and as an audio podcast and on every other platform pretty much. But more than that, if there's something you want to learn more or support the work we're doing, we have a website there's a newsletter you can sign up to. You can both donate and make sure you subscribe to keep track of everything that's happening in this land. Uh, I'm excited. Yale's excited to be to have this opportunity to really dive deep into content from the land of Israel. So, so when I when I look at this, let's say we zoom out and look a couple years back. Mm-hmm. Israel and Iran have been fighting a proxy war and a clandestine war for many years now, well over ten years. And it depends how you count. You could also count much farther back. Mm -hmm. We've been fighting that war through Hezbollah. We've been fighting that war in more recent years through the Houthis in the the Red Sea. We've been fighting that war through various terrorist organizations that existed in Sinai. Mm -hmm. And then in what was Iraq, what was Syria or eastern Syria. Uh, It's layer on layer of of proxy wars. But Israel is not, or I should say Iran's not the only one fighting that war. Israel's been fighting the war. Uh, we've been fighting together with the Americans, with other international coalitions, with international sanctions, with, you know, I, mean, I mean, it's just like this, this very, very, what's the word I'm looking for? Multifaceted sort True. of battle. Yeah, and when you talk about, you know, wolves in this region, it's not just Israel and America against Iran. You know, Saudi Arabia are not big friends with Iran. Yeah. You, they've been at war with Houthis in Yemen for a very long time, and the Houthis are sponsored by Iran also. So this Middle East is forming at least two coalitions at the moment, as far as I can see it. So you have the like anti-Iran coalition and then the pro-Iran coalition or the excess of evil, as we call it, because they're against us, you know. So but why why do why and how did it started, in your opinion? I mean, why did the Iranians want to? So let's let's try to break down like who's who's fighting over what? Let's maybe we start from there. Okay. So we, we differ. We, uh, we're on a confrontation course with the Iranians on several levels. On what? First, it's political, the obvious. 
political is we fight for power, we fight for influence, we fight for your sort of like share of whatever. Of a what? Like what power are we fighting over? So, so the Iranians, let's, let's zoom into like how they were, look at the world. The Iranian government, mm -hmm. this is going back all the way to the Iranian revolution. One, they look at you, Israel, or us, Israel, as their enemy. Why are we their enemy? Because we were aligned with the Americans. The Americans back in the 60s and 70s, 70s were, were highly involved in affecting and manipulating the politics internally in Iran. And you have a whole story with the Shah there and then the, revolu you know, the revolution in, in Iran. They look at that and they still remember till this day that you, you, the, you Israel? I'm doing air quotes for people <laughs> who are watching this. You, Israel, and you, the U.S., affected their politics. And not only that, we allied with the Shah, mm -hmm. who's not looked on favorably. Yeah, for, he, because of corruption. Because of corruption, because yeah. he's an appointed king, because of, of various reasons. They look at that period as, as like an attempt of imperialism to affect their country. And the Americans and their allies, the Israelis, which is us. So that's one layer. Okay. Then you have another layer. Another layer is... And that's past. The first layer passed. Yeah. I mean, the Listen, Shai's no longer there. People so why have, are they still upset? People I mean. have a long memory in the Middle East. Yeah. And we, we, we live in Israel. I think we have this like more Western mindset where we're like, you know, the, let, let, let the past be behind us kind of thing. Mm -hmm. People in the region don't think that way. They have long memories. The, the Persian people have a very, very, very long yeah, memory. Their memory goes back to the Persian yeah. Empire and they exactly. want to reestablish that. Exactly. And so they, they look, then you go to national aspirations. Yeah. How do they look at themselves in the world? And they look at themselves in the world. They're not alone in this, in, in this part of the world. As we are these people, we're the Iranian Empire, or we're the Persian Empire or originally, and we want to restore ourselves to that. Yeah. And not only that, we're the representatives of a type of Islam in this region. You know, Shia. Yeah, exactly. So Islam is split between Shia and Sunni Islam, and they're the Shia. And they, they're the flag bearers of that type of Islam, which is why they're, of course, opposed to the Saudis, because yes. the Saudis are Sunni. They represent that, you know, that movement. Yeah, so by the way, I think that the majority of Muslims are Sunnis, like yeah. about 90%. Yeah. But still, we hear all these destabilizing activities from the Shia in, exactly. in the Middle East. So that's another layer of conflict. Mm -hmm. And then, so they're fighting against enemies and against people that are their enemies and our allies. So we're their enemy too, just by extension of that. And then they want to restore their power and influence in the region. That's nice, huh? You know, then it, get, it, get, it gets... And then when you dive deeper, their ideology is a fundamentalist. And again, this is not all the people in Iran. This is not everyone in the country. The regime. The regime, which is a religious, you know, totalitarian regime, calls for an Islamic caliphate or an Islamic state. And part of that ideology is counter-Westernism, counter-Zionism, counter-Judaism, counter-Christianity. Yeah. It's a religious war that is the embodiment of a state. You know, that's how they're thinking about this. And, and it's, it's a very highly religious, highly powerful religious and political organization. Okay. Yeah. I think, and also the, the reason that they're thinking about it and that they can sustain this anti-Israel, anti-Western thought for so long is because of this religious belief. Because yeah. they're thinking long term. They're thinking, it's okay, so a few generations, we will not have food, we will not have education, but we'll survive this and the democ democracies and the West will not because yeah. they don't have the, the bandwidth to keep on the same line for so long. And this, and I think, is an issue that we and the Americans and the West, we don't understand. So they say, okay, so three generations, we won't have uh, electricity, food, uh, iPhones, yeah. but we'll survive and you'll be, you know, killing yourselves. I mean, you, you raise a very powerful point, which is, and I, I'd say even myself and even you, even though we've been talking about these topics for many years, you know, like, when you look at the way they look at the world, like what their worldview is, what their operating system is, their MO, their modus operandi, how do they look at the world? They look long-term. Yeah. They look through religious eyes. They look through collective, national, tribal mindset, not individualistic. Yeah. And the West examines their political success and stamina and goals through the life quality of the individuals in most cases. What is the GDP per capita? You know, what are the freedoms that we enjoy? Yeah, and the, well, yeah. the short time, the, the short advantages term, yeah. that you make it in your, I don't know, four-year term as, uh, as president or as a um, government official. Yeah, and, and, and think about this, and this isn't really the topic of this, of this episode, but think about the way democracies in the West measure success and the way these countries, you know, like, let's call it religious 
totalitarian or religious, you know, single control countries, mm -hmm. non-democracies, how do they look at the world? We count GDP per capita, we count purchasing power, we count education, education the level, yeah. political freedoms, we count, you know, like what, what, life expectancy. Yeah, the ability for women and men to vote, yeah. and equal yeah, rights. Exactly, and, egalitarian yeah. metrics and stuff like that. We count social metrics of like success and satisfaction. And then on the flip side, on the negative, we count every casualty. We're afraid of casualties. We count every time there's, there's a human life loss. Uh, we count every political upheaval as a loss. True, and they so don't. They don't. They look at the world completely differently. We are the mass of the Iranian people in this case, or other countries, yeah. and this is our goal. We're gonna promote the agenda of this type of Islam, and you are our enemy. And when we look at the world that way, this is them saying this, we're willing to sacrifice financial growth. Personal freedom. Personal freedoms, exactly. And, you know, like e even the, the, the control of law, um, quality of life across the population, and they've done this decade on decade, not a singular event. It wasn't like for the next three years we'll sacrifice growth. Oh, 25 years, 30 years, yeah. Decades, yeah. decades where they've receded in financial growth. They've receded in level of education. They've yeah. gone back on like, I think this is a country that has been under, and, and we'll get, we'll dive into what, this. Sanctions? Sanctions, sanctions for decades yeah. at this point. Yeah. And they're still persevering. And when you look at that, if you try to, to sort of like um, explain it to yourself through the way we look at the world, you're going to fail. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make any yeah. sense. Listen, to me, it doesn't make any sense that why would they, with all their problems, economic problems, leadership problems, yeah. financial problems, and military problems, regional problems, I don't know, I can go on and on and on. They will invest all this money to arm Hezbollah in Lebanon to attack Israel or to arm Hamas, which is a totally different topic because Hamas are even sooner. So, yeah. so basically, after, I mean, together, they will annihilate the Jewish state, and they're going to fight each other and, and kill each other. So it's like... In a holy that, war. That's yeah. a, another and, topic. And all, all that is logical, but I think like a really big thing to focus on is the national narrative. And I, I'll explain that term. It's how these people talk about themselves. What people are we and what do we care about as people? And they look at the world in a... In, you know, in just like a completely reverse way than we do. They strongly see things differently and they act accordingly. And their leaders are willing to make sacrifices and pay prices that don't make sense to us because they're going after different goals. They're going for the empire, they're going for, for, you know, for, for their messianic end times. You and know. each individual in the, in the country understand that he's part of this whole big puzzle. Like yeah. He's one little piece in the end time goal of becoming an empire again, and yeah. they're willing to sacrifice everything for that. I want, I want to introduce another thought, which I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is that all monotheistic, so like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, mm -hmm. uh, and possibly others, depending on, on how you count it, all these religions or faith movements are messianic. And what messianic means, in, in, as I'm saying this, is they believe in a messiah, but more specifically, they believe in an end time series of events. Okay. Judaism strongly believes in that, Yemot Moshiach, days of the messiah. Christianity strongly believes in that. Definitely. The book of Genesis, uh, of uh, Revelation, Revelation and like from Genesis through Revelation, yeah. everything is pointing towards that. Yeah, and, and the end times. Yeah. Is this the end times? Exactly. Are these the signals? Yeah. But also the Muslims believe in that. They believe in the Mahdi. They believe in an end time war. They, they've read our scriptures and they riff off them. Excuse my... They copied? They excuse my, my, yeah. <laughs> now, kind of, again, there was an, there was an interreligious di uh, dialogue. In general, there was like uh, the religions are copying a little bit of yeah. each other or they're influenced by they're each other. They're responding to each yes. other. They too have that mindset. Mm -hmm. And they too are, are playing or acting towards an end times game that they believe. And they reference it. Nasrallah references it for generations. The leaders yeah. of Iran of, of referencing that. And also other Muslim leaders, including the leader of Turkey. Uh, reference those the, those th sort of thought processes. Yeah. So we're all aware of that, and I think it's often it's like for, a forgotten fact that you know we live in this world where people are thinking of like there is an end game here, mm -hmm. and we're even if it's just by saying the words, but we're playing into that game. Um, and it's not a game in like the the fun part of it. It's a game in the sense of like there'll be a, a clash of ideologies, religions, and stuff like that. I think we already see it, but I think that the West needs to understand that in order to solve the problem, we need to address it 
from the mindset of the other side yeah. and not from our side. But uh, okay, so I think what we understood uh, why they want to kill us. It's a is it kind of a, still yeah, a big well, a big ideological reason. One one more layer, and then we dive into the the facts. One more layer is the spiritual world, mm -hmm. and and we say this. I believe this. I assume you believe the same. We're not just fighting a war that is political and financial and ideological. There's a spiritual element to it, and the spiritual element to it is is what the people believe and the God they follow. True. And we believe in a God, and we follow the words, the, 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 the dictates, the, the writings of, of that God. The Judeo-Christian world yes. believes in that. Mm -hmm. And they believe in it in a different world. And there's a spiritual battle. And it, if you look at it in a child, in child's words, the, child, the childlike description of it would be, my God is better than your God. Our God is definitely better, by the uh, way. 100%. <laughs> no question about it. But this is, this is both sides are saying this. Like, yeah. if I win, if I overcome... I may, will go to heaven. Right? And, an, ex and an extension of that statement is, is that this proves, because the Bible we read in this country is not just a theoretical philosophical concept, it's a Bible that describes events in this land to our people the, in our time. In a specific time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, if, so our, the extension of that thought process is, is if me and you believe this, and our God promises that these things are going to play out in this region, well, their belief says the same thing, but very different events. So they need to prove it by acting. Yeah. And so do we. Yeah. So, so we're fight we're fighting the spiritual war that the, the people that are playing in that war game, quote you know, so to speak, are aware of the spiritual element of it yeah. and are, are responding to that too. Yeah, yeah. War game just without the yeah. game. maybe we dive into the facts a little. Okay. And let, let's let's do our best attempt to recap, let's say ten years of of uh what, of Iran Israel uh, Iran Israel like hostilities. hostilities. <laughs> So here, here are the big facts, and I'll start. You can pick up. Well, let's see, <laughs> ten years. I don't know. How how old were, were you? <laughs> Thirty ten years ago. <laughs> uh, ten years ago, so the Iranians have been on the quest of nuclear capabilities for quite some time. They've been on the quest for regional power through proxies, terrorist organizations, militias, uh, other armies, other countries, both by strengthening people and by weakening governments. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've done both games. They're a destabilizing element in this region. Now, Israel has been fighting back in the same sense. We've been, yeah, what, with like a, we've been fighting, the, Hezbollah, we've been fighting their proxies. Oh, we're defending. It's more of a defensive um, war. Is, it's not like we're yeah. taking active... Well, okay, well talk okay. about the assassination, we, we, and then we can go yeah, there later. So but we, it's not official. And, uh, so, <laughs> so we've been taking active measures to fight against their nuclear plan for many years. Yes. And it started with cyber attacks on their facilities. Yes, it, it continued with us systematically over a long time, period of time, according to foreign press. Assassinating uh, the scientists? Assassinating scientist after scientist, program leader after program leader mm. in Iran, in Syria, in hotels around the world. I mean, all this is, again, foreign reports. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they just uh, had a bad diet and ate something wrong. Who knows? But if you... <laughs> For those who can't see us, we're both <laughs> laughing. But I mean, like, think about it through Iranian eyes. For many, many years, to their, in, in their opinion, Israel and the allies of Israel, the U.S. and other countries, have been stopping, preventing, and delaying their nuclear plan. We've been assassinating the leaders of their nuclear plans and other leaders in the country. Yes. And it's been done publicly in their own, on their own ground. On the ground, which is very humiliating yeah. for them. Yeah, and in, in, in their mind... This is, this is all Iranian press saying this, a government, a Iranian government and Iranian press. When they look at the recent series of assassinations in Syria, in Iran, who's doing, you know, it, it's against high-level officials in their, in their government, uh, you know, infrastructure, and they're disappearing and being killed in, in a very precise way and in a very systematic way. And some of these attacks are labeled by ISIS recently. You know, it's ISIS saying we're attacking whatever branch of it it is. Yeah. And the Iranians say, what in response to that? No, oh, it's the Zionist regime and yeah. the Americans or something yeah. like that. So yeah. at first you say, no, like, why wouldn't it be ISIS? And then you look at, like, who's actually being targeted in these attacks. Yeah, who's, who's benefiting yeah. from, from these people being assassinated? And then you can see and understand, I mean, who's behind the attacks. I mean, if it's a, a nuclear sentence... Most likely, Israel has something to do with it. It doesn't hurt Israel, let's put Definitely. it that way. It doesn't hurt American uh, yeah. interests. It doesn't hurt British interests. Yeah. It doesn't hurt all these Western you know, alliance countries uh, yeah. when they attack. Yeah. So th this, like, this semi-secretive and semi-open war has been going on and on. And then in this mix are 
the Houthis and the Red Sea, attacking Israel and the allies of Israel. Listen, the, the Houthis, I have to say, I, it was such a weird thing that they started attacking us. Like, it's like, you think, why would they even care about this? Who are the Houthis? Yeah. Why are they attacking us? I mean, don't they have anything better to do? It's like... I agree. I mean, uh, you fight somebody else. <laughs> the, the Houthis, I think, are the... I mean, the beginning, they were kind of the, the joke of this war. Yeah. But I think that their effect on the world economy and on the changes of the world, and basically on our pockets personally. Now I want to order, uh, I don't know, something from China. It takes me two months because of the Houthis. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's such a weird thing. And I see all their videos and they're having all these advanced weapons and attacking Israel. Like, I bet most of them have no idea who Israel is, what Israel is, except what they told them yeah. against us. That, not even talk about the fact that they're all like fully dressed with military clothes and then they have flip-flops, which I don't get, but maybe it's a, it's a Houthi thing. Secret tactic. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But... Um, but listen, and I think that there's another topic that we didn't talk about, which is the economic yeah. uh, side of all this. I mean, Iran is creating an underground, I don't know, syndicate network of economies that can transfer money between these shell companies to get to Hamas, to get to Hezbollah, to get to uh, the Houthis, to get to other organizations, even outside of Israel, in order to carry their dirty work and their operations. Yeah. And... Sadly, a lot of this money laundering is done by international supposedly aid organizations and through cryptocurrency. So we're heading to a very difficult and hard future in order to battle these sort of systems. And I don't really know, I mean, what's the, the next step because we're always at this wall, especially with technology now, of you have to be one step in advance of the other side yeah. in order to to have the upper hand. And we've seen just now in this attack, Israel w had the upper hand in the defensive technological military capabilities. But uh, if we're playing this game for the long run, we need to make sure that we can keep up being in the front of the lines. And it's all a matter of money. Yeah. I mean, how much money did it cost us to defend ourselves? According to <laughs> reports I've heard out of the IDF and the, the Israeli um, Ministry of Defense, they said that night cost us four to five billion dollars. Was that the number? Four to five billion. Four to so. five for one night. Oh, me, that's let crazy. Me, that's let me, let me uh, double check. <laughs> I want to say... Uh, no, it's, listen, it's, it's an amount. And the sad part in general, as you check, is that defending costs a lot more than attacking. And I think that's also part of the war between the West and the, and the East and the Iranians and, and Israel. We care about the defense of every citizens, and they don't. They will not invest a million dollars to defend... Shekels. Uh, uh, shekels? Shekels. Billion shekels. So By the way, a shekel is like 3.7 uh, shekels oh. is dollars. Yeah, so, so, one so, dollar. so let's say between a billion and a billion and a half dollars... To for, defend ourselves. For, for a single night. It was a nice fireworks show. It was very impressive. <laughs> it was. To yeah. look at so, all so these but before we dive into like the, the, the nitty-gritties of what happened on that night, I think you raise a very, a very important question. And the question is a question of finances. Yeah. Like, you know, we talked about the spiritual, we talked about like, you know, the, the, the um, ideology behind things, but in the end, people need to pay the bills. Definitely. And the Iranians, when you look at the, the world through their eyes for just a sec, they've been under sanctions for decades, specifically in the last, let's say 10 years or so, uh, because of their nuclear program, they've been under severe sanctions internationally. They were kicked out of the SWIFT system, so they can't transfer money. They weren't able to sell oil directly, so they're selling it at a lower cost. You know, they can't buy parts for anything, you know, computer chips. For, I mean, so everything they do, they have to find, and again, so they have money, so they're going to be able to buy at least much of the, the equipment they the need. The black market and stuff like but that. But you, yeah. you have to pay a premium for that. If you can't buy it off the shelf, you have to buy it through third parties. Yeah. You have to sort of work out a deal with China. China according, Russia, yeah. Yeah, again, with other countries that are sort of, again, fighting North a, Korea. Yeah, fighting a similar war. All the other good guys. So, you know, you, you want to fix your jets. You have to buy 3D printers and print out pieces because you can't buy parts. You want to fix your computer chips. You have to buy them on the black market or through, like, you know, uh, uh, fake companies and uh, shell companies in other countries to be able to get the computer chips to run your anything in, in your country, no, uh, military or otherwise. So they're looking at that. They're saying, you've crippled us financially for a really long time. And now we're going to respond in the same token. We're going to hit you where it hurts. It hurts you in the pocket. 
Yeah. So we're going to hit the shipping lines. And if you are a country that supports Israel or that agenda, or the U.S. in that agenda, we're going to hit you specifically, and we're going to say it publicly. Yeah, we're any ship that delivers anything yeah. to Israel will be attacked, even though the Houthis uh, do not really care which ship. Now yeah. they're just attacking every ship they see. Yeah. But, uh, but that's a big deal. So, so, I mean, and again, from their perspective, it's retaliatory. It's not, just, it's not a one-sided thing. It said, you hurt us financially. Now we're going to hurt you financially. You took away our ability to trade and buy things on the market. Yeah. We're, going to do, we're going to try to do the same thing to you. Well, that's a problem <clears> because, uh, you know, who started it goes way back and it's really, nobody really remembers. Who started it? our generation. In this region, it goes back to the 6th century, sixth century BCE. Yeah, yeah. We want to go back to who started between uh, the Persians and the Jews. <laughs> who were here first, yeah. 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 But listen, you know, if we want to go to the Bible time, we were kind of good friends with uh, Hashverosh and all the kings of the Persians. Yeah, but they've... You for, know, a, for, a, for a short time. But they also came, yeah. 6th <laughs> century CE... You know, we have a different problem in this region where the Persians come again. And so, again, like the, his, the history is rich and you can't tell the story of what happened last week without like telling the story of what happened in the Bible a, a or millennia ago or in the Bible. Yeah. No, definitely. So, yeah, let, let's let's dive in. We have this this unprecedented historical, let's call it um, act of war by the Iranians against Israel that just happened a couple days ago. She's a state yeah. actor, finally yeah. a state. So First it's time like where it's like op- openly they're saying... Israel, we are we Iran, the country, mm-hmm. are attacking you, Israel, the country. Uh, it's the first time that's happened openly. Yes. There have been many, many attacks where Israel will never take responsibility, yeah. but it's sort of like obvious that it happened, and Iran won't take responsibility, but it's sort of obvious they were the ones doing it. But they'll do it from Iraqi soil. They'll do it from Yemenite soil. They'll do it from a ship in the sea. It's never, and it's just at, at face value, it's never us against you directly. Yes. This is different. Now, this has a whole different board of opportunities for both sides. Because at the moment, we can, uh, we can carry, legally, we can carry out an attack against the country of Iran and not like a proxy in Syria or something like that. So, uh, so I think that that changes everything in this area. But listen, I think that it's important to, and it's interesting for me, to break down the attack itself, like technologies and like Let's go. What, what weapons did they use against us. So the war between Israel, Iran, and all these proxies in the region, it seems like it's an Israel problem. Like nobody really cares. They want to keep the things as is, as they are, and to keep on and go on with their lives. But we know that this is not how Iranian and extreme Muslim ideology works, right? They don't have their eyes set on tiny Israel and then they'll be happy. Yeah. This is like way bigger than this. I mean, and after they take control of Israel, of their enemies in the Middle East, the plan is to keep growing and to conquer the world. Yeah. And not just because this is a physical war. It's a physical war and say, okay, it's pretty good. I have like half of the world, I'm happy. But spiritual world war, and yeah. we believe this is a spiritual war in general, it has no boundaries. They want to conquer souls, hearts, yeah, people everything. of everybody. They want it all. They want to sow fears in the hearts of people in Australia, in the, the Fiji Islands, in all the forest places on earth that, ha- that people there might say, like, why would I care about Israel? It's so far away. Why would I pray for them? Why would I invest my taxpaying dollars with them? And why would I send my kids to fight there or somehow support these countries? So, so I think that this is important to understand. I, I, have a partial, I have a partial answer for you. Partial, yeah. Because everything that happens in Israel affects the rest of the world. And if you fail to see the connection, it'll show up at your doorstep by the, by, by the, time, soon. You, by the time you realize. This, and this is like politically, spiritually, Geopolitically, it all happens here first, mm-hmm. and then it goes out to the rest of the world. That's cool because it's it's really biblical also. Because so Jesus came first of all to Israel to the Jews, and then the gospel went out to the whole earth. Yeah. Ju- so Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and that, and so again, and so that's just it's both a spiritual concept and also a practical concept. Mm-hmm. People looked at this and they said, well, the Iranians, the Hezbollah, they're an Israeli problem. It's an internal, inner, Middle Eastern issue yeah. until it's no longer internal. Got it. And the Houthis, the Red Sea, is now an international problem. 
Yeah, and it started as an Israel problem. Yeah, a, a few missiles have been fired, and here, usually here and they missed it. Exactly. And, uh, here hit and something. there, they kidnap an Israeli-owned ship or partially Israeli-owned ship in the yeah. Red Sea. Oh, well, well, it's Israelis. They'll deal with it. Until you don't deal with it, and then the, next thing, the next thing that happens is now it's an international problem. An yeah. international problem that can affect the global economy. Like, that's which, how big it is. It, does. it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you think about the amount of trade that goes through the Suez Canal on a, on a regular basis, annually, that affects the economy of Egypt, and it affects the economy of every country that's trading through that route, which is essentially everyone. Everybody from the East, I yeah. mean, instead of doing the whole, you know, around Africa yeah. trip. So, and then, and then if you extrapolate from that, there's a spiritual and a management and leadership lesson to be learned. And the lesson is, if you don't confront evil when it's young and small, it will always get bigger. It'll never go away. It happens with, if you look at World War II, with the Nazi regime. It happens every time you're confronted with something where it's like, oh, he's just the problematic kid in that neighborhood. Yeah. Someone else will deal with it. That's not the case. If you don't step up to the event when it's small, it will become a global problem. Also, listen, this is also something uh, personally. Like, if you have, like, a to-do list... And you have this small task. They say, ah, I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Don't let it. Then, then you don't deal with it until it becomes a yeah. problem and it becomes urgent. Exactly. Yeah, and, and also with bullies in, in school. I mean, you let them spank you a little bit and then they keep spanking you all, all your life. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Mati was kind we of a bully. Talk, That's why he's we laughing. Can talk, you we know? can talk about this later. <laughs> 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 so, so, yeah. So, anyway, by the way, okay. And in general, talking biblically, there's also a good side to this. Okay, so why should everybody uh, pray for Jerusalem and why should everybody look at Jerusalem? Okay, because God has a relationship with Israel. Not because the people of Israel are special or good or better or anything. We are not. We like Despite who the people of Israel are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, usually God chooses the, like, the worst or the most difficult situations in order to prove yeah. that he's great. I mean, and not us. We're not special at all. But he chose us. And because he chose us and because God, because God is faithful, then he will fulfill his covenant to the people of Israel and protect us. But also, why would he do that? Not just because he said so. Because Israel is an example, a microcosmos, so that the whole world can look at Israel and see, okay, our God is yeah. faithful to the people of Israel, so he will be faithful to you to me, to our well, family, to our day-to-day -day life. It's a biblical concept. Yeah. It says, I, if in you will, so the blessing is compounded. It's to a people in a land at a time. Mm -hmm. And we're there. We're a people in the land at this time, and the events happen. And, and then it says in many, many words throughout many, many passages of the Bible that oh, the blessing and, by the way, the punishment, and the but, but hopefully we're in the, the blessing phase of things right now. That's how I, I read the history of it. The blessing will be seen to the other nations, and the other nations will see that these people have been blessed. And how do we see that? I think the Abraham Accords is a great example of Definitely. other people. And I, and I think I missed, and I think many people miss, the significance of Muslim countries in a Muslim neighborhood saying we identify God's hand on these people and wish to align ourselves with these people even though their neighbors are who their neighbors are. Well, definitely. What I like about, about God and in general about, uh, about his principles is that even if you do not believe in God but follow his principles and these principles carry a blessing with them, you will receive that blessing even without believing in him as your God. So that's, we see that also in the Bible, but we see that also these days. Like, bless the... The children of Abraham, and yeah. you'll be blessed. And we see that even with Arab nations that are Muslims and do not believe in our God. 100%. So that's, that's pretty cool. And, and now I think we're, we've given enough of a backdrop yeah, we to can really talk about di exactly. dive, in, dive into what happened. Okay, and for those of you who just accidentally stepped on this podcast, if you want to hear more, learn more about what's happening in Israel, in the Middle East, and basically in this region, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at TV in Israel, or go to our website at www.tbnisrael.com or on X or on any other platforms that uh, we have. Soon this will be also on Apple Podcast. So please subscribe, send your comments, send your questions and topics of discussions for here. By the way, 
we are operating also on donations. So if you want to see more videos, you want to see us being thrown off an airplane or travel the country, please donate and help us create more interesting content from you from Israel. So on, on the night, uh, I'll get started and my memory will fail me at a certain point. We can continue. I was sleeping that night, trying to sleep. Trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah, we all trying to, to sleep. sleep. Phones ringing, yeah. explosions. So, so the, on the night between the thir 13th and 14th of April, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where was this? Saturday. Saturday night. Ago. Sat between Saturday yeah. and Sunday. The 13th and 14th of April, because I, I don't know when people are going to be watching this. True. Uh, we, we have a warning in advance. This happens about almost a day before that, that uh, the Iranian government is preparing an unprecedented attack against Israel. In their words, it's a response to several other attacks that happened over recent weeks and months, not in Iran, in, uh, on, on, in Syria, against yeah. officials in the... By the way, you know, that's super cool that our intelligence was able to pinpoint, I mean, specific attacks. Yeah. Very, Even though it's like, it was so big that it's hard to keep it a secret. Yeah, so, so we, you know, the, the word comes out, and I think... I'm guessing this was leaked also by the Iranian government. I, I don't know personally. Uh, maybe. Uh, that, that attack is coming, and it's a direct attack from the Iranian government mm -hmm. onto Israeli soil. What is the nature of it? We don't know. Uh, and the warning comes through both on, like, so I'm still actively in the army as we speak, or as this is being recorded. Uh, it comes down in the military channels. Yeah. It comes down through the civilian channels. Through the main media. Uh, you know, Everywhere. Yeah, mass media. Essentially, we're warned as a country this is coming, and it's coming tonight. What is it? At first, it was unknown, unknown uh, attack of an unknown nature. And then the word comes out, it's going to be from the air. It's going to be suicide drones, many of them, ballistic missiles, many of them, cruise missiles, many of those too. Sounds like an apocalyptic uh, prophecy, you know, like movies, swarms of drones about to attack Israel cruise missiles, better prepare. Of course, it's on Saturday when everything is closed and we're supposed to be relaxing our Sabbath. Yeah. And, then, and then whenever it was in the evening of Saturday night, there's already word that comes out that these strikes are already en route from Iran to Israel. Yeah, that was pretty, that was pretty was intense. It, was like, when was it? 7, 8 p.m., I think. Yeah, yeah. Like the drones uh, are, are... Swarms launched. of drones, yeah. Swarms of drones, and you see on Telegram channels and stuff like that coming out of uh, Iran, yeah. you can see the drones flying through the sky headed, you know, west towards, uh, yeah, yeah. towards Israel. And I, f I felt concern. I felt fear. I think everyone in this country was connected to what was happening. Mm -hmm. It's alarming to know that, like, a large-scale attack is, is on, <laughs> on, on the way to you, and all you can do is, like, I have no effect over it. I just, all I can do is pray and wait. That's Listen, it. just to tell you, my wife and I, we went to sleep with our pistols next to our bed. Not like we're going to shoot, shoot drones in the sky. I don't know. Just to make you feel a bit more safe. But uh, no, so definitely much. nothing, I mean, makes sense. It was just so big and so weird and something yeah. out and, of a and, movie. And then the numbers start coming out. And the numbers are, let me, let me get this actually straight for once. Uh, <laughs> where are we? The, the, the numbers are, so they're flying all the way from, from within the country of Iran all the way to Israel. Yeah. Uh, some of these, these aircraft are traveling over 2,000 kilometers, so 1,300 miles or more in distance. Uh, which is why we knew in advance, because this is six to eight hours of flight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Loitering drones, drones are usually not incredibly fast. What's that, 100, 136 drones? Something yeah. like that? We're, t we're talking hundreds of flying objects. Loitering drones, suicide drones. Um, and when I say drone, like what, what the, a civilian mind imagines is, the is like the li right? a little drone, a quadcopter and stuff like that. This is not the case. Uh, like I hope we can put a picture up on on the screen, but imagine a drone that is a small air aircraft. It's a plane that can fly for eight hours with a you know explosive payload yeah. the size of a human. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, 50, 100, 130 pounds uh, payload or more. And these are the small drones. Yeah. And then you have ballistic. And they're also stealth, right? Yeah. The some, I mean, some of them, they're, they're small also. That, that's a challenge with drones. And they're slow, right? They're slow, slow yeah. small, fly low, so then it's hard to detect. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you raise this, this, the technical side of it is, mm -hmm. is that no country has ever faced a swarm of drones successfully. Um, there's a whole field in robotics called swarm robotics. Anyway, though, the whole idea is that it's very hard to stop a swarm. Multiple, yeah. yeah. Because you can overwhelm both the signal intelligence, as in like the radar systems, the, the electronic ability to systems. attack. Yeah, and in the over, also overwhelm the defenses. Because even if I have a missile defense system, I can stop one, two, three, 
10 at a time. 136. 150 yeah. at a time. It, it can overwhelm the system, and then they punch through your defenses. Plus, they also are coordinated between each other, yeah. so that makes it even harder. Yeah, and it's coming in waves, and you know yeah. it gets into like, well, you know, if you, if you have a battery of missiles, you have to reload. The reload takes time. In that time, there's okay, another today. wave, and they, they punch through your defense on, on that. Yeah, and well, at least uh, we are uh, the number one in many things, huh, Israel. Also, being the first country to be attacked by swarms. Yeah. The, the world, the, the Guinness record of... Uh, of weird things for a country, <laughs> the things that you don't want to have. Yeah, I, 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 hope can, <laughs> I hope this list doesn't get longer in the future, but so, so you know, you have the, the small drones and then you have the ballistic missiles. So again, these are ballistic to, to frame the sizing of these missiles. We've had pictures on our, you know, in our uh, Israeli press of the size of some of like the, the wrecks of these, these things. And like the, the, bur the, the back burner of the rocket is the size of a small car. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the, I mean, we're not that, like handheld, I'm talking, things that are the size of a bus that are flying through the air with a substantial payload uh, to blow up, and we'll get to the targets later, but to cause substantial damage. A few of them landed in Israel, like yeah. maybe one, like two. Like the, the right? wrecks of them in the yeah. Dead Sea area and a, in a couple area, other areas. And then there were, there were cruise missiles. So cruise missiles are slower and very slow flying objects that fly very close to the ground. Mm -hmm. So if you're imagining in your head ballistic missiles usually yeah, it goes they have, they have, an, they have a, a very large arc of flight so it's like it's, it's almost it's very you know semi-circle uh, they go up into the atmosphere and then they come back down yeah and then the cruise missiles do the exact opposite they hug the ground as they're flying mm -hmm. and they're flying close and they're flying fast and they also i don't i don't know enough about the iranian uh, cruise missiles i know what exists out there where they're able to sort of change their course so it's very hard to calculate their end um, their end destination. Yeah. So again, when you're fighting rockets, you're fi fl uh, fighting flying objects, it's a very complex algorithm of connecting where you are, where the object is now, and where it's flying. Mm -hmm. And you have to sort of figure out this very multivariable uh, um, uh, well, calculation yeah. where I can intercept it, and then there's another layer. Should I intercept it? Because maybe it's not gonna make it to where, I'm, where I think it's going. And if I intercept it, where will the debris land? Yeah, that's that's a big issue. You know. So, but I think the Israeli technology is able to either calculate it. A lot of our anti-rocket defense systems can calculate the the tra trajectory of this missile, as well as also destroy the debris when we impact. At least we see that in the, the Iron Dome anti-rocket defense system that are destroying the missiles fired from Gaza towards us mid-air, and there's not many projectiles being, uh, you know what I mean, launched and hit the ground from that, uh, from that extent. Yeah, but again, and again, so that's exactly what I was trying to say, is, like, is the Iron Dome, for instance, they usually put the interceptors and the point of interception above open, open spaces, yeah. agricultural, forest, whatever, not densely populated areas, because you don't want, you know, rocket debris falling through windows or, or uh, the True. roofs of uh, buildings. So here you're dealing with that and hundreds of these objects flying at the same time. You mentioned this, one of the big challenges with smaller drones is their speed. And it's almost counterintuitive. You would imagine that a jet fighter or a rocket would have no problem hit, hitting an object that's flying at 10% of its, its speed, or you know 15% of its speed, but it's exactly the it's opposite. the opposite, because you're so fast, yeah. and you you're, cannot like, yeah, track you're, it. You're so fast, they're so slow, they're so small, so their radar cross-section, the, the, the size of the object that shows up on the radar, is for many radar systems too small to even lock into the radar systems. So even if you had a jet that can identify the object, they wouldn't be able to get a lock on it. Yeah. So it turns out this is, this is open information as of a couple days ago. Uh, Israeli jet fighters, especially the new generation of them, mm -hmm. have radar systems that have been uh, adapted to also lock onto small, slow flying objects. That's pretty cool. So, and, and again, especially so that we did that before this attack. Yeah. So, someone eight years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, already Not thought into it. the future and said, we're, This is becoming an issue. Let's modify our system so we're able to track these tiny objects. And again, think about it. They, they have, again, the, the, the radar footprint or the electronic footprint of a bird or a balloon. You know, it's, it's not yeah. enough to, uh, to really lock on in most systems. So, they were able to lock onto them. Our missile systems were able to lock onto them. We were able to coordinate mm -hmm. the uh, response to it. And in a very, very broad uh, sense of the way, 
Israel with its allies intercepted, I think the number that came out is 99% yes. of everything that was thrown our way or flown our way yeah, from definitely. the Iranians. Yeah, but it's also important to say that one reason that Israel is so good at defending itself and the skies is that we're super small. Yeah. So our, I don't know, sky borders are super small. So you, you put like 20 planes in the sky and they can cross all across Israel, fly across Israel f in less than a minute or two minutes. So that's a difference. If we were the United States or Russia, a, a huge country, it would be very hard to protect with, everything. Yeah, yeah with, with the amount of, I don't know, just to place the batteries of Iron Dome, yeah. of Arrow 3, all across our borders to defend ourselves. Yeah. So I think that's also a key issue, and I think that issue also served us well in all the wars in the past. Yeah. I mean, we keep saying that Israeli Air Force is the best in the world, which I think is pretty good, but it's also the fact that they have a very small country to defend. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I 100% agree. Uh, because because we've, you know, you're fighting in an airspace where you're fighting also against enemies that are far removed from you, and and our air force. I, I, ah, you mean you're fighting above the Middle East, not just above the yeah, Israeli like, air force, uh, air space. Yeah, like yeah. The, the air force is, is both defensive and offensive uh, tool, and you you have to be able to also fight outside of it. We, I, I mean, yes, I understand what you're saying on like the the parameter of, yeah. of defense. I'd say it's it's a proof what happened, you know, on, on that night between the 13th and the 14th of the month is this proof of concept of like the, the, the overarching um, structure of our air defense systems. So to sort of break down what, what exists, Israeli, the Israeli airspace is defended from different types of weapons by different types of response systems. Oh yeah, uh, okay. Uh, Iron Dome is the, the lowest flying system. Yeah. Iron Dome defends in the tens of kilometers or tens of miles, yeah. uh, and even less, like it can even defend for you know, very close uh, systems. There are other systems in development that are supposed to give an, um, address the, the problem of even shorter range uh, projectiles, uh, larger mortars or even smaller. Yeah, uh, yeah, and there's, there's several yeah, others in development. Arrow, all the arrow. Se several two. others in development that, uh, like the laser system that's, that's yeah. not yet um, deployed uh, operationally speaking. And then you, above that, you have many, many layers. Uh, we don't have the time or the, the visual aids to explain we'll all of We'll talk about it next program. Yeah. But you have one layer on top of the other. One is just ballistic. One is ICBM, intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles. You have all these layers of, of our own defense missiles that answer the problem of other systems. But, this is but. a big but, we're not alone. Uh, and I think that, for me, that was one of like the big things that happened on that night, is suddenly you understand how important it is to have friends in the neighborhood. Definitely. And and again, but you like you're talking about Jordan, Britain, US, the U.S., France, the U.K., France, according to certain uh, reports. I don't know if it was, was it made public that uh, they they took part in it. I don't know if they uh, made it public, but I heard a lot I've, of I've reports. Heard that. I've heard I've heard that they were part of it too. On, even on like the level of having fighter jets in the sky fighting uh, alongside our planes. Yeah. Uh, and then you have neighboring Arab countries in the region. Uh, Jordan, who, I mean, and again, it, it makes sense on their level. Jordan and possibly others. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this yeah. because I don't know what we're... we're Maybe we're, there are also others that don't make it public yeah. because they don't want to support Israel publicly, but they don't want Iran to succeed. So you have all this behind-the-scenes situation. Let, let's say this. When you look at the web of influence... So our enemies have a very strong web of terrorism and militias in our region. Yeah. But Israel, as a friend and an ally of the U.S., and as a country of itself, has a network of allies that spread outside of the borders of our country. We have a peace agreement with the Jordanians, and the Jordanians legitimately wanted to protect their airspace and not allow a foreign army to fly over their airspace on an yeah. attack mission. And they shot down you know, um, the, some of the drones, including, I think I saw like a report that said that the, one of the... The princess uh, was one of the fighter pilots that shot down. Uh, do you see that? No, the princess. Uh, the she, princess. she flies a fighter jet. Uh, let me double check. That's pretty cool. And anyway, but because <laughs> I know, I know the king. He's. I know a, he's, he's. He flies vehicles. helicopters. No, he flies helicopters. The king, I so believe. Princess is flying uh, yeah. fighter planes. Let's see, let me look it up. Cool, cool royal family. Let's they're see. they're very. Uh, <laughs> they're very. They're they're very cool people. <laughs> well, but I think also it's it's on their best interest to stop Iran 
because Iran is smuggling tons of weapons through Jordan to get to the West Bank. And this is really destabilizing the Hashemite kingdom, uh, which is Jordan. Okay, I, I'm not sure it's a true thing. She is a pilot. I'm not sure she was part of that. I'm not sure she's a princess? No, she is a princess. I'm not sure. And she is. <laughs> she does fly. She, there is a princess. We, here's what we know. She is a princess. Okay, good. She does fly a jet. But don't know which jet. We don't know that she was part of uh, intercepting any of, the, any of the drones on the night of the night of the 13th and the 14th. Okay, still sounds like a cool, cool story. If it's true, it would be a really cool story. <laughs> a- anyway, good, good. So, so, so so listen, Vati, are we heading to an escalation in this? Re- is it gonna be worse, or it's like it was enough for now? And then you know, Israel allegedly will assassinate more leaders, and then Iran will do maybe more stuff like this, maybe not. Maybe more. I mean, what's up? Are we? Here's a word of caution. Talking the. Let's tell me the future. Here's a word of caution. We say in Hebrew, to the, to the drunk. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> Okay. The, the prophecy is given to the fools, not the drunkards. Uh, so are you giving the prophet, meaning you are not the fool? No, no. It's not to say that we don't believe in prophecy. Yeah. It's to say at this time, six months into more than six months into this this war and many, many years into the conflict with the, the Iranians, is we know what can happen. But that's a very different thing than saying, I know what will happen. The possibilities yeah. are, 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 they're not infinite, but there they're are so many sort of dis- decision tree splits that can happen in the Iranian government, in the Israeli government, in Hezbollah, right. in, in many countries around us, that it's hard to tell what the next, next step will be. You can imagine, okay, it, tomorrow and next one week. One step ahead, yeah. One step ahead, I can usually, like, you could guesstimate what will happen. We have an option of Israeli retaliatory, yeah. you know, actions now. Yeah. Like either to assassinate somebody, to conduct an airstrike against a military yeah. base in Iran, to attack the proxies, which we do all the time in yeah. Syria, Lebanon, and then also to force, force the international community to sanction the Iranians economi- economically, which is what I've been hearing that the Israeli politicians are saying now, this is the time that the world should sanction Iran even more and let's make them suffer economically. Um, But I don't think we can know what will happen further ahead also because the leaders of Iran are very old. Like uh, Ayatollah Khamenei is like super old. I don't know how old he is, but he's like, he looks like a hundred for sure. And our leaders are also in power pretty long. Like Netanyahu is a long time in power in Israel. So anything can change with the shift of, uh, of the leadership on both yeah. sides. Yeah. And, and, and again, so you, you raise the, the question of, of the interest. Yeah. The, the Iranian government, again, they do things that we don't find to be logical. Yes. But they do have an internal discussion where they're weighing the, the cost-benefit analysis of whatever attack they're doing. And what we've seen so far is they rarely do something where they're like, I know what's going to happen, and I'm going to, I'm going to like, I'm, I'm going crazy. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do something that I know that is going to like set the whole region up in flames. Everybody's super calculative of their responses. It's, it's always right? one step, half a step forward, but not to the point where I'm like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm making uh, myself, not to the point where I'm making it uh, uh, wor- irreversible, worthwhile, irreversible, irreversible. Not, not worthwhile negotiating yeah. with or discussion, discussing yeah. with. So the American president comes out, Biden, and, and he says, he says the, to the Iranian government, he says the same thing he said to Hamas, don't. Don't. Yeah. don't. And what don't means is, let's do break this do down. Do not do. <laughs> no, yeah. That's at face value. You know, when you dive deeper, they have assets in the Red Sea. They have aerial assets in the region. They have the responsibility in like all these layers. And you know there's always communication going on behind, you know, sort of behind closed doors. That's that piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And the Iranians know what we have as a country. And we know what they have as a country. Everyone knows what the costs of, like, like Israel could immediately at the same night or even before. Well, launch, launch some atomic bombs. Look, uh, get them, well. I mean, that's extreme. You could launch ballistic missiles that hit in the middle of, of you know, of, of the Iranian of Tehran, capital. Yeah. Of Tehran and blow up, you know, a government building. You have the ability to do that. You chose not to. Because, again, this is like a calculated game of... Chess doesn't even you know begin to describe it. 3D chess, yeah, uh, where where you're like bit by bit sort of figuring out the next the next step piece. I, I think if we what can we really know that's going to happen? The tensions that the level of tension that exists today isn't going to disappear overnight. 
Lovely. And you know that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Sadly, but sadly, people are super adaptable. I mean, it's not like I, I go to work afraid or stuff like that. It's like we just had 300 things, missiles, explosions being fired at us. And today I sent my girls to, to kindergarten like nothing, you know, and we have life going on here super fast. So I think that's pretty crazy that humans can adapt to any situation. Yeah. I mean, Israel is officially at war since the day it was established, according to the Israeli government. Yeah. And it's, it's true. I mean, and uh, you're in the army for, uh, what, six months now? <laughs> like, you months. come here and you talk to me like, ah, it's okay. We keep doing it. And then you wear your uniform and go back to, <laughs> to Judea and Samaria. So it's, uh, it's very weird, but I think that, I mean, in general, humans can, can adapt to, to any situation. But, but you it, talked about the, the, um, the military strength. Yeah. So is Israel stronger than Iran? I mean, they have m- way more numbers than us. I mean, if you talk the number of tanks, they have more tanks. If you talk about the number of soldiers, they have more soldiers. So we have, what, better advanced technologies. But can we win, like, an all-out war against the Iranians? I'd say the answer is no in both directions. We will shoot missiles, they'll shoot missiles. We will run out of our defensive missiles, and then those missiles will hit us. I'm assuming that they have more missiles, a lot more than what they fired at us, because if they would have fired everything, they would have nothing left to defend themselves. Yeah, and I, I would hope we have more defensive missiles. Right. But, I mean, I mean, there's several questions here. One on, like, the cost part of it. Mm-hmm. Like, if the Iranians did this attack every night... It would force your hand, as Israel and the alliance... But to develop more defensive missiles? To, to attack them directly. Ah, okay, to stop it. To, you'd have to stop them. Because it's and expensive and because we just don't just, live like that? You, but we can. Listen, we are living like that already. I, I, I imagine, I don't know if this is I mean, true, I imagine that the Iranians launched that attack assuming that most of it would be intercepted and stopped on the way. And they, they did it to the degree... Where they knew they they would able to be able to save face. Yeah. We attacked the Zionist enemy. Yeah. And you see the footage coming out of you know Tehran the next day. Everyone's celebrating. The government's like, yeah, we showed them. You know, <laughs> and the people are celebrating in the streets. And what's funny is the same thing happened in Israel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we showed and them. We, we showed them. them. We now like, they know, and it's all like a a battle of information. Yeah. And, and they're controlling their media. We're controlling our but, media. But both sides are are correct. They did. They did, they did deal us a very substantial blow in the fact that they threw all of this weaponry and, and, and technology and attack at us. Yeah. And you defended yourself well, but you still had to defend yourself. Yeah, plus I think that in their eyes, defending is not such a cool thing. I mean, attacking is the cool thing. Also, like, plus, we, listen, the whole country was on high alert for, for a week, for yeah. a few weeks, and st- still, like, the schooling system stopped, people didn't go to work, uh, airplanes... Yeah, did not fly to Israel. Yeah. yeah, that's that's an effect that nobody is calculating. So it's not just humans' life, yeah. but the sad part is that the whole Western world, if you don't have blood, they don't allow you to respond. We've seen this in October seventh, where they actually killed uh, one thousand and two hundred Israelis, and Murdered. that gave us the legitimacy to really invade Gaza and take control and attack Hamas and do everything, and nobody was speaking against it so loudly at the beginning. You know, time, time goes by and then people change and then they become, okay, it's enough. But now, because of our advanced defensive capabilities, the world does not let us respond. I say, okay, you can defend yourself, so keep defending. Yeah. It's kind of annoying, I don't know, not it's fair. A, it's, it's, a bit it's, of a, right? it's a bit of a catch. I mean, if, so if we would have let 100 people die, we would have the legitimacy to, con- to destroy a building in Iran, yeah, according to the international community, and, and, and right? Again, the Israeli government could have also decided to to publish that uh, somebody no. that 100 people died. No, no, not no. That would, uh, we have free press here. You wouldn't yeah. be able to do that. Or we wouldn't but, be able to speak. But here. ultimately, you'd be able to be pushed to the point where you're not able to stop everything. Yeah, and, and uh, those are just facts. Like you can't. Defense is always something that can be penetrated. Exactly. It's much easier to attack than it is to defend. Much cheaper also. Yeah, m- much, much, much cheaper. So, so we're, we're playing on different <laughs> ideological planes, so to speak. You know, they're, they're thinking one thing, which is we, we want to save face. We want to show that we're victorious. We want to show that we've had to 
um, put fear in the hearts of the Jewish people. And Israel is playing the game of we want to defend our citizens almost at any cost. Yeah. So that that's that difference between or distance between the things. And, and I think more more than anything, like if you look at, at what's been happening, put a, put aside the public statements. Mm-hmm. Look at the actions. Uh, the actions are that the alliance between Israel and the United States is incredibly strong. That there has been an international coalition of people of like-minded interests to fight against the Iranians at a very, very you know intense level in recent months. Uh, bombing the Houthis extensively, you know, uh, putting a lot of military assets inside the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. Public statements from different countries. Yeah, moving moving airplane carriers to the Middle East yeah. and other stuff. So we're not alone in that in that sense. And things might get worse before they get better. I don't know. What I do know, and I think this is important to sort of like end with this, with the, the philosophy of God. Yeah. And, and the philosophy of God, in, in my mind, is is that I know a couple things in life. And I know a couple things historically, and the Word of God is, is very clear about this. God is sovereign, and God is faithful, always. Mm-hmm. And He's shown that time and time again through history. The challenge is, is that we never know in real time how it's going to unravel and how it's going to sort of uh, play out. And our human mind has trouble keeping track of a, of a, a plan that is, you know... Too big. Too, too big for us and, to... And three steps too, ahead too that big, we can't comprehend. comprehend, yeah. And also, I think it's important to bear in mind that God doesn't promise it's going to be easy. Mm-hmm. And it never is. Uh, nothing of value in life comes easily. Definitely. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so we know it's going to be hard. We know it's going to be scary. We know we're going to have to sacrifice. But we do know God's faithful and God is true to his word. And I think that's what really matters in the end. It's yeah. like, is, is keeping, keeping our eyes and our hope on that. Yeah. And I'll say just one last thing on, on hope, because this is important to me personally, is hope is faith in something you can't believe in. And I'll explain what that means. Is if, if you knew what the milestones to whatever that end goal is, you wouldn't have to have hope. Hope is believing in something you don't know how it's going to happen. Or oh, I see. You know what I mean? You don't know how we're going to get to there, but you still have the hope in the fact that it's going to happen, mm-hmm. even though you don't know how it's going to play out. Yeah, exactly. And I think that uh, now it's almost Passover here in Israel. Yeah. So I think it's good to, to conclude. I don't know if you have more time, but in, in general, I like to conclude with they try to kill us. Every generation, they try to kill us. Yeah. And God protected us miraculously. Yeah. Let's go eat. Yeah. So hope you have a happy Passover, yeah, Mati. The statement is, they tried to kill us, God saved us, let's eat. I like my version like better. One, one last thing, I'll <laughs> say this to the audience at home. We're, we're planning to do this on a regular basis. Uh, it's going to be both an audio podcast and on YouTube. So if you want to have more of these deeper discussions, uh, make sure you subscribe on whatever platform you're consuming this content right now. Definitely. Uh, we're going to spread it out throughout the different platforms, but the idea is to have a platform to regularly dive deeper into topics that we find to be important Mm -hmm. uh, that can really enrich and edify people uh, who want to learn more about what's happening here. Definitely. And one more important thing is that if you have any questions or topics that you want us to discuss here in this platform, then send it. Send it on the comments. Send us uh, an email. uh, Go to our website and register. Basically, let us know what you want to talk about. So thanks so much for watching our first ever podcast talking about what is happening in Israel and the Middle East. I'm Yair Pinto, and this is Mati Shoshani here with me. If you liked our content, please subscribe. Please send your comments, send topics that you want us to discuss, and join us again next week. Yeah, this was fun. It was very fun. Let's do this again. Next week.